technology industry, uh, both doing what you do in hospitals uh, all day, about 10 years of that career, and the rest of the time in medical devices and now test and measurement. So i um, really happy. It's been a really good career. I hope it's being good for you. Today, we're going to talk about uh, doing testing on non-invasive blood pressure uh, monitors and so forth. Um, so there are some uh, things that I learned while I have been here at Fluke Biomedical about 15 years or so that I didn't know when I was doing what you're doing. And so we want to make sure that we're sharing that information with you so you're doing the testing uh, about uh, non-invasive blood pressure uh, and getting it right relative to your understanding of what's the difference between measuring for accuracy uh, for the specifications uh, and then the difference between doing a dynamic simulation. So we're going to talk about some of those things, about um, monitoring technologies and how they work and performance. Okay, so again, blood pressure overall, NIVP monitoring technologies, and the NIV performance testing. So just to review, blood pressure is the product of the flow of blood times the resistance in the blood vessels. And the resistance in the blood vessels varies. Um, your blood vessels aren't just pipes, they're, they flex. And so they constrict and they expand. So when we make this measurement, we're looking for two different parts of this reading and then doing some math calculation. Uh, systolic, which is the pressure in the arteries when the heart contracts, and then diastolic pressure, which is the pressure in the artery when the heart is uh, relaxed. Right. So here's some of the norms. Um, just in case you're, you're trying to think, is my blood pressure normal or abnormal? And what is, uh, what is, what is the nurse or the doctor going to be thinking about? So if your blood pressure is less than 120 over 80, it's still in that region, still normal. If you're between 120 over 80 and 140 over 90, you're high to normal to high. And if you are equal to or more than 140 over 90, your blood pressure is definitely high. And if it's equal to or more than 180 over 110, it's very high. And you can see you might want to start having conversations with a physician, a doctor uh, from the high range, uh, although high normal is also an area of concern. But these are kind of the clinical normals and the ranges that, uh, that the doctor and the nurse are going to care about when they look at the measurement that's displayed on that NIBP monitor. So there's two general ways that we determine blood pressure, uh, non-invasive blood pressure. The one, auscultatory, is the way the nurse and the doctor have been taught uh, from school how to do a blood pressure measurement. And your doctor or the nurse in the doctor's office uh, when you go in is going to take a blood pressure measurement Th this way, auscultatory, or even nowadays more and more, they're actually going to use an automated blood pressure device, which is an oscillometric device. So let's take a little peek at auscultatory measurement. So what we want to know is uh, we're going to inflate, inflate the cuff until we block the flow of blood in the limb that we're going to listen uh, to the blood vessel. And the clinician then is going to uh, listen for crot cuff sounds, um, which are the sounds that are made when the blood stops flowing and the sounds that are made when the blood just starts flowing again. So while the clinician is listening with a stethoscope on the blood vessel, the artery in the limb in, on which we have the cuff, um, they're going to let the, the, uh, the pressure, the cuff, air pressure in the cuff leak off a little bit 
so that they can get from zero Karatkov sound to the Karatkov sound that they hear when the blood starts flowing again. And that's how that auscultatory pressure is done. So in the oscillometric way of taking the measurement, these are math algorithms that are um, that are used to determine when you reach the peak pressure or the highest pressure in the cup. And the technology needs these algorithms in order to properly choose where is the actual highest pressure. So you can see on the uh, graph on the left, figure number two, that pulse amplitude and cup pressure are related and that they matter. So each of the little spikes on the, uh, on the uh, uh, top uh, curve there on that uh, on that graph show where the inflection points are when the uh, when the blood pressure is being measured. The graph on the right, figure three, is showing you two algorithmic ways that the uh, the blood pressure gets determined in the NIBP monitor itself. The the uh, height method is actually a statistical assessment of the pressures in the cup. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The other graph on that, on that same figure uh, is a point slope, a series of point slopes, which, as you may remember, is calculus-based. So the one on the right or on the left is statistical. The one on the right is calculus-based. So we're going to go into a little bit more about how how that uh, how that measurement gets made. Okay. All right. So um, in particular, the height method algorithm uh, is um, the peak amplitude is e is equated to the mean arterial pressure or MAP, and it's normalized to some percentage left and right of the highest pressure in the cuff or the pressure that the monitor picked that it thought was the highest pressure in the cuff. So there's a little bit of wiggle room here. I want you to know that. Um, also, you need to know that that 100% normalization isn't always 100%. It can be a different percentage depending on the clinical study results that the me medical device manufacturer of that NIVP monitor has come up with in the studies that were required for them to get their FDA clearance to market. And whether that was a 510K clearance or whether that was uh, a, a, a PMI or pre-market pre clearance, doesn't really matter. There were clinical studies that were done, and those are uh, used to tweak or make fine tunes to the algorithm to get the right measurements compared to sometimes compared to invasive blood pressure measurements on the same patient, sometimes compared to auscultatory measurements of blood pressure on the same patient. So it may not be 100% left and right. We call those points standard deviations left and right of the pressure that the monitor picked as the highest pressure in the cup. Okay, so remember there's wiggle room there. On the, on the other side of things, the slope method is calculus based and the cup pressure is uh, in a, a, based on those series of point slope values and kind of the area under the curve based around the peak pressure, whatever the monitor picked as the peak pressure in the cup, All right? So remember this, the monitor is picking that pressure. It may or may not really be the actual peak or highest pressure in the cup uh, because there's a lot of other things that go on and other noise that actually causes a lot of different peaks in pressure in the cup. So it's, it's not just pure. It's, that's why we say uh, this is a little bit kind of magic it's a little bit kind of magic, not quite, but you need to know what the variations are. So um, the standards 
or that, are, that you guys uh, and all of us were using are really coming to the manufacturer for them to use in the, their design validation. And then out of that design validation comes what you see in the service manual test procedure for NIVP for a particular NIVP monitor or patient monitor that includes NIVP. So those standards are for the United States, Amy ANSI SP10, whatever the latest uh, revision of that is, or if you're looking at the international standards, it's IEC 60601-2-30. So those are the two standards. And uh, as I said, if you're working in a hospital, you are going to follow what the manufacturer's recommendation is around uh, pass-fail criteria about how the testing needs to be done, but they all originate in these standards. Medical device manufacturers, of course, are the, uh, are the people for, that these standards are targeted to for their design validation testing before they get clearance to bring that product to market. All right, so how do we determine the, uh, how well this particular patient monitor is meeting those requirements in the standards and, by the way, is meeting the performance specifications that the manufacturer has claimed in the service manual in their specification sheet? So the static pressure test is used to determine the accuracy of the blood pressure measurement. It is the only way that accuracy can be determined. You cannot determine accuracy with a dynamic simulation. No matter what all of us older guys, and I'm one of those, it told you or says they learned the actual deal is you have to use static pressure comparisons to get accuracy. Well, so what the heck is the dynamic simulation for? Well, it's repeatability. So no matter if no matter what is displayed on the monitor when I compare what I sent in the simulation to what I see, as long as I see that very same value displayed every time I send a specific value the, from my simulator, then that is a repeatable, that's repeatable. That's showing me repeatability for the same values that I've sent. But it's not about accuracy then. Not, not, not. It's about repeatability. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And where did we learn about these? Where, who is guiding us in this way? Well, uh, it has to do with metrology and with traceability, which is all part of the uh, SI units of measure and an agreement, an international agreement that was entered into in like 1875, way, 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 way back. And more and more uh, countries become signers and agreeers to that international agreement every single year. So part of that organization is called OIML. It's the Organization of Legal Metrology and it's an international organization, and their guidance, their advice about blood pressure, especially NIVP, is that the NIVP simulator cannot be used for accuracy assessment. There's too many variables that are not controlled in that, in that way of doing the assessment. So they suggest those are okay, but not for accuracy. They're okay for repeatability. So that's where this learning is coming from from the Organization of International Metro Legal Metrology, and this becomes part of the standards. The standards get guidance from metrology in order to come up with pass-fail criteria. So when we say we're following Amy ANSI SP10 or the international standard, we're saying that includes the recommendations of how to make the measurement, that is, the testing methodology that needs to be used. So that's the foundation for why we do static pressure comparisons to get accuracy, and dynamic simulation is okay for repeatability, but only for repeatability. All right, so uh, here, here's the deal. 
in order to do static pressure measurements, what you have to be able to do is seal the pressure container. But what is the pressure container? The pressure container or the vessel is the cuff and hose that go back to, from the patient back to the monitor and the monitor's internal um, plumbing and measurement sensors. Those are all part of the vessel. We have to be able to seal the vessel to be able to make the measurements for static pressure comparison. To do that, the, the, that, that means sealing off the pressure relief valve. The pressure relief valve, by design and by requirement for safety for the patient, is a normally open valve. So un unless you can close that valve, you're not going to be able to seal the vessel and you will not be able to produce pressure in the cuff. That means you have to be in the service mode of the particular NIVP monitor or patient monitor that has an IVP. You have to be in the service mode to be able to do that. So indeed, that's what you have to do. You have to know how to get into the service mode of the particular brand and model of patient monitor NIVP. And then you're going to do a static pressure comparison. In a lot of cases, the patient monitor needs to be the source of the pressure. It needs to produce the pressure itself. And that's fine. Uh, we can use something like ProSim 8, which is our latest uh, model uh, for NIVP assessment, or our uh, ProSim 4, either one, as, the, as kind of a digital pressure meter in that case. And what we're doing is we're looking at the same pressure that the monitor is producing um, with a set value or a series of set values. That is the static pressure level comparisons. We're going to do those and we're going to see it on our simulator, which is now a digital pressure meter. We have a calibrated test instrument that is at least four times more accurate than that patient monitor, which is get what gives us the ability to be able to do that comparison properly and traceably. So, I mean, you could use other, there are other uh, simulators out there that could do the same thing and that's fine. We're just gonna talk about the one that we know the best. So we're gonna compare those, what we, what is produced in terms of the pressure and displayed on that monitor's calibration or service mode screen to what we see on our pressure meter and knowing that our pressure meter is more, the more accurate. And any inaccuracy means it fails the test and we, we go to a corrective action. So calibration simply means that comparison and a determination of it, whether it's within its pass-fail criteria or not, okay? So let's go back to our, what about repeatability? And remember what I said about the patient monitor, the MIPP system is going to pick what it thinks is the peak pressure or highest pressure in the cuff. And it picks that, whatever it chooses, may be wonderfully precise and may, or it may, it may be off a little bit compared to what is sent, in this case, by the simulator, by something like ProSim 8 or ProSim 4. So, uh, what happens, though, if the NIBP assessment or measurement is not within the, our, ex, our expectation? So if we sent 120 over 80, but we got something else on the display screen, that is uh, different than what we expected it to be. Now what? Now what do we do? Well, what we've done with the ProSim 8, for sure, and ProSim 4, is we have created a way when it comes to repeatability and dynamic simulation for us to kind of true up uh, those statistically uh, based algorithms to help the patient monitor pick the peak pressure that we sent, all right, to help the monitor pick the right peak pressure. So that thing is called envelope shift. Well, let's take a look at what we mean by that. Remember, we're looking at the, the graph on the left side of the figure in this slide, and the, the problem here is the peak pressure is slightly left or slightly right of 
where it ought to be based on where the peak pressure that we're creating. So here's how that envelope shift works. The dotted line is what the monitor picks, uh, what the monitor picks, and the red line is kind of where it really ought to be. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use this envelope shift to move our peak pressure kind of left or right to help the monitor pick it, pick the one we're sending. When the monitor picks the one we're sending, then the displayed uh, systolic over diastolic measurement will be closer, if not spot on, to what it is that we're sending. Again, here with the simulation, we're looking for it. We're looking to see on the display screen of the monitor what we sent in terms of the patient simulated signal, right? Again, remember, this is not about accuracy. This is about repeatability. That's all it's about. And so this envelope shift is, some people have called it a cheat. It's not a cheat. It is helping the monitor be truer to our expectation so that we can be sure that when the, the nurse or the doctor says, hey, I, I'm getting a different reading when I listen to this blood pressure than what I'm seeing on the monitor, you can have them put their stethoscope on the vessel on the limb that the cuff is wrapped around and listen and while the, the patient monitor, the NIBP monitor, makes its measurement, and they'll hear their Karakoff sounds will match up better to what it is that they're seeing on the display screen. So it's all about this helping make sure that what you send is what you see, and it's about the repeatability of, of, uh, of the uh, NIBP assessment is what it's really about. I hope that helps you understand it. If you don't understand it, even with this explanation, quick explanation, please zing us an email, let us know uh, what, uh, th that you need to talk about a little bit more, and maybe we can get online with you or get a phone call or something like that. We'll try and, and, and cover it again uh, in a way that, that, would, uh, that would work for you. Okay, so NIVP is really all about a, a, a few things. It's about uh, your automated NIVP system, testing system. It's about uh, being able to do remote testing. It's about custom test procedures so that matches the brand and model of patient monitor that you're trying to do testing on. And it's about documenting your test. So what we're showing here is onboard automation of the testing using the uh, auto sequences that are built into Prosim 8, uh, and, or alternatively to using the, uh, our, our answer test automation is what's displayed on this particular, the bottom picture, um, to um, configure the test instrument for the test we need to do and to automatically collect the measurement value or to give you a space to enter the value that you see displayed on the patient monitor screen. So why do I see two different things there? Well, first remember, if we're doing an accuracy test, our uh, uh, digital, multi, uh, digital meter, pressure meter here, is either the Prosim 8 or in this, the bottom picture here, you're seeing a BP pump 2, which is an older device. Uh, from us. And so in that case, we're going to collect the measurement automatically. If, the, if we're doing the dynamic simulation, then what you're going to see is you're going to need to make a little bit of a, a manual entry based on what you see displayed on the patient monitor. Okay, so in summary here, blood pressure overall is generated by blood flow and it's a, diagno a diagnosis for a determination of is this patient have high or low blood pressure or are they relatively normal? And that goes along with a lot of other things that the doctor, the nurse is looking at. 
to determine what is wrong with this patient and also then to uh, make some determinations along the way of how, how well their treatment plan for that patient is working. So any of you who have high blood pressure and are receiving a prescription for that, you're gonna go back to your doctor once a year, once every six months, depending on what's going on with you. And they're going to keep a trend of all of your, all, all of the blood pressure measurements that they make. Uh, if you go into urgent care for some other, uh, something that you're sick, they're gonna make an NIBP cuff measurement to, to go along with other uh, vital signs that they're gonna use. So it's really, really important that we get this right and that the measurements are accurate and repeatable, both. Um, the performance testing, remember we're gonna use stag pressure comparisons for accuracy and we're gonna use the dynamic simulation for repeatability. Okay. I thank you all for, uh, for the time that you've given us this morning.